Mayor versus People is our next voluntary manslaughter case. Or it would be if Mayor's victim had died. Miraculously, Mayor's victim survived being shot in and through the ear. Mayor was convicted of assault with intent to murder. The issue on appeal is whether it was error for the trial court to exclude evidence of words and circumstances surrounding the assault. The jury had been denied the opportunity to hear Mayer's sad story about what was going on between Mrs. Mayer and the almost deceased victim, Mr. Hunt. The appeals court found it helpful to analyze the issue as if the charge was murder. Not unlike Gerard, Mayer had not witnessed Hunt and Mrs. Mayer in flagrante delicto. But a jury could find that he had a pretty good idea of what was going on. Unlike Gerard, the Mara court rules that Mayer's plea in mitigation and the facts supporting it should have been for the jury to decide on the full evidence. The doctrine of voluntary manslaughter not only requires the defendant to offer evidence of legally adequate provocation, it must also show that there was an absence of cooling time. A provoked defendant who waits too long before killing will be denied an opportunity to plead in mitigation that he was provoked. Some courts will allow a defendant to try to persuade the fact finder that his passion was rekindled, perhaps by some mocking remark, which in itself would not constitute legally adequate provocation. In any case, the mayor court holds that cooling time is also normally an issue for the jury to decide on all the evidence. The dissenting judge in mayor insists that requiring that the defendant have witnessed infidelity in flagrante delicto serves to ensure that the innocent victim and those who had not given provocation not be the sufferers. The dissent seems to regard the plea and mitigation to be a partial justification for killing the guilty victim as much as a concession to the understandable weakness of the accused. Should it matter? whether Mrs. Mayer and Hunt had really been going at it in the woods? Should the prosecution be allowed to prove, say, that Mrs. Mayer and Hunt had been entirely chased, as together they planned a surprise birthday party for the insecure and impetuous Mr. Mayer? The traditional doctrine is not entirely clear on this point. What does the model penal code have to say? In the case of People v. Kasasa, we get a helping of the Model Penal Code version of the doctrine of voluntary manslaughter. Kasasa was convicted of murder in the second degree at a bench trial. In Kasasa's case, it is easy to understand why defense counsel would advise the accused not to face a jury. Kasasa is not an easy guy to sympathize with. The issue on appeal is whether the trial court erred in failing to find that the defendant had established that he had acted while under the influence of an extreme mental or emotional disturbance, as set out in the New York statutory provision adopting the doctrine proposed in the Model Penal Code. The court refers to this as an affirmative defense, but what it means is plea and mitigation. What is involved is the Model Penal Code version of the traditional doctrine of voluntary manslaughter, a serious crime but a grade below murder. The Model Penal Code states, Criminal homicide constitutes manslaughter when murder is committed under the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance for which there is reasonable explanation or excuse. Note carefully, murder is committed. The traditional definition of manslaughter as homicide without malice aforethought misleadingly suggests that heat of passion negates the mental states that constitute malice aforethought. Intent, for example, 
that is not accurate. It is better to say that, with the model penal code, that what would otherwise be murder is mitigated to manslaughter if the accused acted under a certain influence. Extreme mental or emotional disturbance. Notice that there's nothing here about provocation or about the conduct of the victim. The drafters of the model penal code wanted the fact finder to train full attention on the subjective mental condition of the defendant at the time of acting. But the focus is not entirely on the subjective state of the defendant. The influence must establish a reasonable explanation or excuse for the actor's conduct. The Casasa court held that it was no error for the fact finder to find that Casasa's disturbance did not furnish a reasonable explanation or excuse. Think back to some of our earlier cases, such as Guthrie. Convicted of murder in the first degree on retrial despite his body dysmorphic disorder. What result if Guthrie had offered a plea in mitigation? His victim provoked him, but only with a flick of a dish towel. That can't count as extreme battery as required under Girard. Nor can a fail reply to a single act of offensive battery count as mutual combat. So the traditional doctrine of voluntary manslaughter would not have assisted Guthrie. But under the model penal code formulation of voluntary manslaughter, a jury would be authorized to reduce Guthrie's conviction to the lesser offense. That seems sensible, doesn't it? Isn't Casasa as messed up as Guthrie, though? How does the model penal code cut slack for Guthrie without cutting slack for Casasa, too? The model penal code directs the fact finder to determine whether the defendant's extreme disturbance furnishes a reasonable explanation or excuse for what happened. It adds, the reasonableness of such explanation or excuse shall be determined from the viewpoint of a person in the actor's situation under the circumstances as he believes them to be. A person in the actor's situation. In the circumstances as the actor believes them to be. It sounds as though the viewpoint the jury is expected to take is utterly subjective. It is defined with reference to the actor's perception of his situation. Does stepping into this situation amount to looking at the world as the defendant did? Consider this case. Jack Ruby, pictured here, fatally shot President Kennedy's assassin at close range shortly after the assassination. Obviously, under Gerard and the traditional doctrine, Ruby would not have been entitled to a voluntary manslaughter instruction. Would the model penal code extreme mental or emotional distress plea have been available to Jack Ruby? He idolized the Kennedys and was devastated by the assassination. The comment to the model penal code states that the word situation is designedly ambiguous. Oh, great, ambiguity. Just the reverse of what we need. The comment goes on to include handicaps and some external circumstances, such as blindness, shock from traumatic injury, and extreme grief. Well, Jack Ruby acted under the influence of extreme grief. How about this defendant? Scott Roeder was charged with first-degree murder in the shooting death of Wichita abortion doctor George Tiller in the lobby of Tiller's church, where the doctor was serving as an usher. 
obviously under Girard and the traditional doctrine, Roeder would not have been entitled to a voluntary manslaughter instruction. What about under the model penal code? Hadn't Roeder acted under the influence of extreme grief for the hundreds of fetuses Tiller had aborted? The model penal code drafters saw this problem and addressed it by adding that despite other ambiguity, idiosyncratic moral values are not part of the actor's situation. Are minority moral values idiosyncratic? If so, Roeder would not be entitled to an extreme mental or emotional distress instruction under the model penal code. This result would require the court in effect to decide what moral values count as idiosyncratic and which ones do not? Or is that a question to be directed to the jury? The model penal code comment concludes that in the end, the question is whether the actor's loss of self-control can be understood in terms that arouse sympathy in the ordinary citizen. Girard, Mayer, Casasa, Guthrie, Ruby, Roeder, each lost control of a murderous impulse. Some are easier to feel sympathy for than others. Obviously, the principle of legality and the principle of proportionality can tug us in different directions on the question, should we retain the doctrine of voluntary manslaughter or simply do away with it? Shall we dispose of it because of its unclarity or shall we keep it because it allows us to distinguish a greater and a lesser offense? If you are unsure too, I sympathize.